Welcome to the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast, hosted by your favorite duo, Stephen and Charlene. They're here to help you transform your mindset and create a positive outlook on life. Are you tired of feeling stuck and unfulfilled? Are you ready to take control of your thoughts and emotions and rewrite your story? Well, you're in the right place. They will be sharing inspiring stories, practical tips and expert advice to help you on your journey to a better you. You'll learn how to let go of negative self-talk, embrace your strengths and focus on the good things in life. Each episode will be joined by amazing guests who have rewritten their own life stories and are now living their best lives. From successful entrepreneurs to accomplished athletes, we'll bring you stories of resilience, courage and triumph. So grab a cup of coffee, get cosy and get ready to be inspired. Tune in every week for a new episode of the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast. Let's rewrite our stories together and make every day count. In this episode of Rewrite Your Life Story podcast, we hear about Angela Reynolds. Angela is a woman who has truly rewritten her life story. Originally from New Zealand, Angela had a successful career in the hospitality industry, working in Japan and London before settling in Sydney in 1998. However, it was in 2005 when she first went to Thailand as a volunteer with Mercy International that her life truly changed course. With a plan to stay for just three months, Angela ended up staying for two years and then returning to settle in Thailand and discovering a passion for helping disadvantaged children and teenagers in the process. So join us as we delve into her story. Before we get started, we want to remind you that the information presented in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and their guests are their own and do not represent the views of any organisation or entity. Additionally, any information presented should not be taken as legal, medical or financial advice. Always consult with a licensed professional in the respective field for any advice or guidance. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's dive into today's topic and learn how to transform our lives through positive thinking and taking control of our stories. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin this episode of Rewrite Your Life Story, we want to provide a trigger warning. This podcast explores personal stories and experiences that may touch upon sensitive topics. We believe in the power of storytelling to inspire, heal and create connections. However, we understand that certain stories or discussions may evoke strong emotions or memories. If you find yourself triggered or overwhelmed during this episode, we encourage you to prioritize your well-being. Take a pause, breathe, and know that it's okay to step away if you need to. Reach out to a trusted friend, family member, or mental health professional for support. They can provide a listening ear and guidance during difficult moments. Remember, you are not alone and there are resources available to help you navigate these feelings. Take care of yourself and engage in self-care practices that bring you comfort and peace. Thank you for listening and let's continue this journey of rewriting our life stories with compassion and understanding. Well, I'm really excited to be interviewing Angela Reynolds from Mercy International in Thailand. How are you, Angela? I'm doing great. Thank you, Stephen. Whereabouts are you in Thailand? Uh, I'm based or located up in the northeast of Thailand um, in a province called Con Gen. Um, it's about 600 kilometres northeast from Bangkok. Okay. And how long have you been there now? Um, I've got a bit of a staggered, uh, a staggered journey as such. Altogether, I've been volunteering uh, with Mercy International here in Con Gen for almost 12 years. And is that home now for you? Or Yes, it is. <laughs> So you've got a really interesting background. When I was reading your bio and Charlene, yeah. you, you were reading her bio as well. We're reading together. You, you've lived in a, quite a few countries and you've had quite a diverse background. Tell us a little bit about your past, your upbringing and, and what were some of the catalysts that caused the change in your life? So I, I'm a Kiwi. I'm from New Zealand. My, my parents and an older brother, I was working for um, an international hotel, hotel chain, the Sheraton Hotel chain in New Zealand. 
I was working with them from about the age of 18. So I didn't quite finish high school, had enough of school. <laughs> so I decided to get a job working in a hotel. And eventually after a few years, I had the opportunity to go and do an employee exchange program in Japan. Through a few different chapters, I ended up spending two years in total living in Japan. That just gave me a flavor of for the world that I didn't even know existed until I left New Zealand. And looking back now, I can also see, even though I wasn't a Christian at the time, I can also see that God was preparing me for everything that's involved with cross-cultural living, living away from family and friends, um, different language, different foods, essentially having to re-establish life again. Of course, at that stage, I had no idea that you know, about my future either. Yeah. And I uh, was there working in a, a Japanese ryokan, which is a Japanese style hotel, had a really fantastic time. I just, I really, really love Japan. And then after that, I moved on to London. I did the two-year Antipodean visa um, over there, and I continued to work for the Sheraton when I was in London as well, which gave me some great exposure to, to life and to different opportunities away from New Zealand. Once my two years was up, I went back to New Zealand and really struggled. So I then had the opportunity to move to Sydney. So I did that. Um, the job that I moved over for, I didn't stay with very long. And through temping opportunities, I found myself working for uh, dairy farmers, okay. which um, whilst that brand is still well known, the company itself no longer exists because oh. of mergers and acquisitions. But um, yeah, so I, I started working for dairy farmers uh, when I was 30 found myself walking through the doors of a church <laughs> and once again my life was significantly changed because of yeah the decision I, I made to then commit to to walking with walking with Jesus as part of that to I mean there are so many things I can look back on now and see that God had his hand on me you don't always know it when you're walking through it, but I can look back now and I can see that the people he was putting around me, the um, the doors that would open, even just my way of thinking to, to provide opportunities for God to be able to do things in my life, which were going to be exponential blessings in my life. So in 2003... I, with a uh, missions trip from the church, I came to Thailand to visit the Mercy International Children's Homes. And as part of that, I don't even think I was in Thailand for 24 hours. I was, I, I remember the, the leader of the team saying, does anybody think that they would want to come back again? And this was on the first day. And I just put my hand straight up. I had no idea what that meant or how that would ever happen, but I could just, and it was right from the very beginning at that, on that particular day, at that particular home, all the children uh, were HIV positive. Yeah. And so as, as part of that, I think that that was also God doing something in me um, from a compassion perspective, a mercy perspective, empathy perspective all that kind of thing that I didn't even know that I I you know had going on <laughs> had, had that I didn't even know was inside me after we did that trip it was a two-week trip and then we went I went back to Sydney and I was just encouraged to pray about it for about a year that was the time frame that the the team leader the pastor said to me pray for pray about it for a year so I just went back back to my job at dairy farmers I had some really great opportunities in the corporate world including training so I had started doing my MBA to be able to essentially progress and develop in the corporate in the corporate world like that was what that was the path that I was going down almost almost to the day it was probably about a week after I'd been back for a year I just woke up one morning and I just said it's 
time to do it. Like it's it's time to go to Thailand. Was there a catalyst that brought that on or was it just an inspiration? That particular moment, I think it was just an inspiration. Right. There wasn't anything. They, it could have been a little bit of boredom maybe, yeah. boredom with, with where I was at with life. Yeah, but it was nothing. It was nothing significant, nothing major that that made me want to do that. I made the decision. I decided I would go for three months, but I still decided I would resign from my job. So just to give me that freedom. So I put all my stuff in storage and then I actually came over about three weeks after the big tsunami that Okay. that happened yeah. so um I remember watching that on tv thinking wow that's where I'm going although I, I'm, I've come to a very different part of Thailand so a long way away from beaches and and any of those areas that were damaged um three months came and went yeah there was never any intention of of going back at that stage uh it was interesting that my my boss continued to reach out to me and three months is up you're coming back now <laughs> so so that 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 continued throughout throughout the time but then it was interesting that just under two years I really felt um called to go back to Thailand but to go back to Australia three months oh no you stayed two years I oh. stayed two years okay. my plan was to come for three months but I stayed for two years yeah. I then I, I then felt called to go back to Australia and to work in the administration and PR side of things for Mercy International, which was based in Sydney at that at that stage. And and it was really interesting because it's one of those things that you think, you know, you've invested so much into the lives of these children. And when it's time to go, it's going to be so sad and devastating and tragic and emotional and Whilst it was obviously sad, it was actually relatively easy. And I think once again, that, you know, if that's what God's plan is, he's yeah. going to take away all that hard stuff to deal with. And it means that it's, you know, it, it's his plan. I, I did, I was, I worked in the, in the administration side of things, which is, essentially my my strength my areas of strength the administration and, and business administration marketing um, PR I love talking to people about this ministry um, so I had lots of opportunities to do that but then also there came a time where I got got a, a message from my ex-boss who said are you ready to come back yet and it felt you must uh, have been I, great <laughs> And you know what? I felt I'm ready to go and have that coffee with him and talk about it. And so once again, yeah, I finished up what I was doing with Mercy International. And to be honest, when I walked out that door, I thought that was it. I, like I would, would always continue as a partner and as a sponsor, but I never thought that I would be involved in the ministry in a direct way again. I, I, I kind of felt that was it. So then I... Um, started back at it was still dairy farmers at that stage and then soon after started the mergers and the acquisitions and I continued working there for about seven years during that time um, it was amazing particularly the leadership opportunities that I was given where um, I had so many training courses and the the, the, the company that essentially merged was is very very good at investing in their people and even that taught me things because now where I'm back now you know I've learned so much about how to treat people and how to invest in people and how to bring the best out of people you know so I can see that everything I went through there was you know once again God preparing me despite me not even knowing I was going to come back again so I was, I had lots of different roles during that time because we had, because of the mergers and the acquisitions, things were constantly changing and I was able to um, reach one of my life goals, which was to own a home, but not only own a home, I got to build my dream home in Sydney. So that was a not that, easy thing of itself. In no, Sydney. and that was a big thing for a single Yeah 
female to be able to do but and I look back now and I you know I think of the day that I bought the land and I had um, a life group that night and I just said to everybody can you pray for me because I've bought this and I actually <laughs> don't know how I'm going to pay for it you know like from a from a monthly perspective and but it was a big step of faith and then within a couple of weeks, I was offered, not not had to apply for, but was offered a promotion with a significant wage increase. And so straight away, and those were the kinds of things that I refer to in the opening when I talk about, you know, God's exponential blessing yeah. without even, you know, it's just a case of taking a step of faith and then listen, you know, and, and, and being open to listen to, to what God's, where God's at in it as well. I can imagine it being quite scary for you during those times where you're just stepping out in faith and like not knowing what's going to happen. What was that like for you? So one of my fallback positions has always been, what's the worst thing that can happen? So when I left New Zealand and went overseas, the worst thing that could happen is I go back to my family in New Zealand. When I left Australia the first time to come to Thailand, the worst thing that could happen is it doesn't work out and I go back to Australia and I find a job again. Yeah. So it was always kind of like, what's the worst thing that can happen in this situation? <laughs> That's such a good perspective. because yeah. I can imagine that a lot of people don't do anything because they don't have that attitude, like what is the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's no one's going to die from my decision here. No, no. Sure, I might have to start again, and which is what happened when I did go back. I went back and I was working for, uh, you know, for Mercy International on a very, very small wage, which was not sustainable in Sydney, yeah. you know, in, 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 in a Sydney lifestyle. And that was essentially one of my um, one of my challenges but it was also that was the worst case situation for me yeah. so it being able to do that yeah so then then I I really started to think about coming back Thailand started to come back into my heart again and um, so I'm living in this beautiful dream home that I was able to build and everything. And I, I, I was starting to feel, um, I guess, a little bit bored or overwhelmed or stressed with the job that I was in. But I also knew I had got to the stage of my financial commitments that whatever job I do to be able to pay off my mortgage mm -hmm. is going to require a job with that kind of stress and that kind of responsibility. Is this what I want to be doing for the next 30 years while I pay off my mortgage? Yeah. That's right. And the big word that came to my mind when I was thinking about that was purpose. It's like, what is my purpose in life? So I've never been married. I've never had my own children. Both of them are desires that I've had funnily enough I made the decision when I turned 40 that I didn't want to have my own children because I'm too selfish now and there's no way I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night to a, a crying baby as well when we hit 40 so yeah. we understand yeah but the funny thing is I've raised 16 newborn babies <laughs> <laughs> that I have, yeah. I have majority of them I've cared for for either anywhere between six weeks to six months where I've looked after them from being a newborn. So I've had lots and lots of sleepless nights after turning 40 <laughs> because of <laughs> because of babies. <laughs> but um, anyway, so purpose was a real big thing for me. I, so then I really started to think about it. I um, then came up with a, just a plan that, so this is where, this is where the, the whole, everything started to get interesting for me in my decision-making and just seeing how God was at the helm, God was in control, and my plan was completely washed away. So I, my, my plan then was, okay, well, I'll retire when I turn 50, until I'm 50, I'll work really hard. 
I will um, build up a portfolio of investment properties. And when I'm 50, I'm going to go back to Thailand. I'm going to be completely self-sufficient and I'm not going to need to be dependent on anybody to support me. I'm going to do it all myself. A few months later, um, I mentioned that the children's home that I um, volunteer, I mean, it is the home that I'm at now, but we've had a lot of changes since then. But um, when I lived here the first time, it was a home specifically caring for children living with HIV and AIDS. So um, one of the girls, she was 11, she passed away. And so I came back over for a week um, for her funeral. And I said to God, if it is your plan for me to come back again, I want you to tell me this week while I'm here. Yeah. And during that week, a couple of things happened and I kind of thought, oh, is this really what I want to be doing? But then by the end of the week, I was quite convinced that I was going to be coming, coming back. My 10-year plan, I would change to be a five-year plan. So I would just come back with a few less investment properties. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So then I um, I went back. So just to give you an idea of, of timing. So I came to the funeral in May 2000 and 2012. May 2012 is the timeline. I went back to Australia and... Um, a couple of weeks later, I was working late one night. I'd had a really busy day in the office. It was time to go home. I went into the kitchen to do something. And this is in the office at work. And I had a slip on the floor, completely, absolutely nothing, just fell on the floor. When I sat up and looked at my ankle, I thought, ankles are not supposed to be able to bend like that. Like wow. nothing happened. I didn't trip over anything, nothing. Like, wow. And anyway, what happened from that particular fall was um, uh, seven weeks of non weight bearing. So I had quite severe, significant surgery. Like, I really, really shattered my ankle. I was off work full time for three months. Then, obviously, all the post physio and everything like that. So that was a really big deal for me. And one of the biggest reasons it was a big deal was because I am, I was always such an independent person. I never needed help from anybody. Yeah. And then I got to the stage, I couldn't even, I had to have a friend come over and tell me how to shower. Like I couldn't make a cup of tea. I, I, because I couldn't walk on crutches and I, it was a really, really hard time. And I crumbled, you know, watching daytime television for seven weeks is not all it's cracked up to me, <laughs> especially when you're a busy person yeah. and, you know, and, and, and independent and social and everything like that. I had a lot to learn during that time. And not only about learning to lean on others or not, or learning not to try and be in control all the time, but also there was some internal emotional stuff that needed to be dealt with that I had no idea I needed to deal with until I was at home. I couldn't drive anywhere. I couldn't run away from the situation, which is what I could be accused of doing in the past because I couldn't drive. I couldn't go up steps. I couldn't do anything like that. So I was physically grounded. I had a really special friend come and talk to me and she said to me if you are going to go back to Thailand you need to go back to be you need to go back as a whole person whole and healed person because obviously I was dealing with stuff and I didn't even know I had it to deal with until it came up to the surface if you're going to go back and you're going to be a mama to those kids they need a mama that is a hundred percent whole like has dealt with emotional baggage and stuff that I didn't even know existed. I just took a deep breath, had a big cry, all of that kind of thing, and then just said, that's what I want to do. I do want to go back and be a mama to those kids. I worked through the months following, and then towards the end of 2012, I then was um, diagnosed with skin cancer, and I had to have surgery for that. It was on the day that I was um, driving back to the specialist to get the stitches out 
after having the surgery that uh, I'd, I'd had a couple of other things happen. So just to take a step back, something quite influential for me was the song um, Oceans about opening up borders. And so that was that was really impactful for me. Um, the church at my church at the time was doing a, a, a Bible study. And I remember one morning reading about Peter stepping out of the boat. And when you asked earlier about when you, when you asked earlier about making these, you know, these decisions um, and having the, I guess, the, the courage to do it, you know, what, what do I do? So I was reading about Peter stepping out of the boat and I was sitting in, in an armchair on a carpeted floor and I just had, I didn't physically do it, but I had the sensation of stepping off onto the carpeted floor and the carpeted floor being being Jesus and being so strong and so firm that there's no way that I could drown or no way that I could fall through that floor. And 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 that was essentially Jesus telling me that he's not gonna let me go. Um, he's going to be holding on to me and I can trust him yeah. as a foundation. So that was very powerful for me. And then um, then a few days later when I was um, going to get the stitches out of my back, I was driving in my car into, and I had to go right into the, the city centre of Sydney and I was driving in amongst the traffic and I really audibly heard God's voice saying, what are you waiting for? And so my answer to God was, <laughs> well, if I go now, so that we're still in 2012, at the end of 2012, if I go now, then I'm going to need to sell my house, quit my job and sell everything I own. Because this time I'm not going to put everything into storage. I'm going, I'm going for good. But if I go in four or five years time, like I planned, well, I've got to quit my job, sell my house and sell everything I own. And God said to me, so what's the difference? What are you waiting for? And so then my reply to God was, well, if I wait a few more years, my house will be worth more and then I'll have more money to go for. And then God very clearly said to me, do you not trust me? Wow. And then it was a case of how do you say no to that? Like, you know, if you know that God is asking you that question and it's very tangible like these are not these are not conversations I have with God every day like you know there's only been a couple of times where I've had I've known it's God talking to me so for him to say do you not trust me that was it that that was the pivotal moment in me saying okay I'll go and I'll go now so I essentially had to go through the process of um, you know, talking with the leadership of Mercy International about coming back. They've always, always said to me they'd love to have me back, but only if God's telling me to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Don't come. Don't come because don't come for any reason than God's telling you to come back. And the reason for that, having been back here for 10 years now, is doing life like this is not sustainable in my own strength. Yeah. So if it's not God's plan for me to come back and do this, then I would have I would have left a long time ago yeah. because it's hard. It's it it's hard to do it. But that's also another it's that's also another confirmation that this is what God's got planned for my life you, as well. You say that it's hard to to do that. And and there's so many elements to to that hardness, you know. Tell us like what is a day in your life? So Every day is different, and I guess there's lots of different seasons as well. Primarily, my my role is to be the advisor. I am the advisor here. I manage and mentor a team of um, eight Thai staff um, who are effectively the the carers and um, administration groundsmen cook for for running our home. So um, that's that's a major part. Also, my unofficial role is mummy. Like I, I, you know, I've, I'm, I've 
probably been the most consistent person in the lives of most of the children that live here now. And so um, they have, yeah, they've grown to to see me as as, as their mum. Um, as well as obviously we've got we've got our, our carers um, who who are, are, are mother role models to them as well. That is a big part. Also fundraising. So we're a private organisation. We have no government support. And so just being able to make sure that we can um, provide the best possible quality care and opportunities to the children. And I say opportunities because it's not just about being able to put food on their plate and have give them a warm bed at night time. It's about the rest of their lives and what we can invest in them now to shape their futures. Yeah. So education is a huge part of that, but just the everyday teachings of how we of how we do life. So yeah, so I'm very much involved in, in the decision making for for the children as well I, I just I just had a memory come to my mind and I remember when a mutual friend of us who put us in contact for this interview came to to Thailand for a week or two to help out and, and stay with you I, I remember she saying one of the biggest needs was paracetamol because yeah. you get paracetamol for the kids you know, like it's it's a simple thing for us. Mm, we don't take it for granted. We take that for granted, yeah. but yet that's what you were needing at the time. And and once again, um, it comes down to the quality. So we can get things like that here, but we just know that the quality of the medication from Australia is 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 better. Yeah. So so it's about being able to give the best quality to the children as we can, yeah. and as we can do that. Are the children referred through social services? Are they, how do the children come to you? So there is a whole different, there's a whole different ways and it all depends on where we're located as well. So where I live, there is a, a very, very large government home here with over 200 children living in it between zero and six years of age so very young so essentially in the in the province that I live in any uh, so any re referrals from the welfare department or the hospitals or the police or anything like that all go to that government home but where our other home is in prayer which is um, way up north they don't have they don't have that same uh, they don't have the government home and so those um, referrals go to the, the home there. Generally, what happens is that the children, if they're newborn babies, they will come down to live in the home where. So we we re relocate them to the home where I'm at because it all depends on space and capacity and you know the situation at the time that a, a child comes. Um, but there's also we have Facebook pages and websites and Thai as well. So sometimes we get. Um, contacted directly by a mother or a family member depending on what the situation is to give you an example so we've got um, a boy who he is he's seven years old now he's been with us since he was two weeks old his mother um, her husband was in jail and then she got pregnant to another man everybody was concerned that when the husband came out of jail he was known to be very violent and he would just kill everybody including the newborn baby and so the family can, um, actually contemplated their own ways of ending this two-week-old baby's life mm -hmm. until some people in the village where they were living knew about, who knew about us said, well, why don't you bring him here? So he's been living with us since he was two weeks old and he's seven and a half now. Um, that's one story. Another story is a, a little boy who is six years old and sorry, I just need to get a tissue. Um, it makes me emotional. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, I guess we don't hear these stories, so we don't realise, like, the intensity and, and the emotions they do bring because living it every day. Yeah, we take things for granted so much out of here. Yeah. So another, another story is um, one of our, uh, he's just recently turned six. His mother had HIV and she had received a lot of negative what's the word um 
so so HIV still carries a big stigma in in Thailand. So she was ostracized um, from where she was living. And so she made the decision she was never going to tell anybody again that she had HIV. She then met a man. And so she didn't tell him. And as part of that, she stopped taking her medication and going to the hospital for her um, regular doctor's visit. She then got pregnant. He was then, the little boy was then uh, born five weeks early. And then she died three weeks later. So the whole time that she was pregnant, she was dying. And so he didn't contract HIV, which is a miracle, because she did nothing to prevent the contraction between between mother to baby. But he has quite a severe brain development problem. Having said that, though, so he came to us when he was um, it was a, w- a week after he, he was six weeks old. So it was a week after his due date that he came to us. He and, and he was eighteen months old when he was diagnosed with. We could see that there was there was some development problems there, and he was diagnosed um, by an MRI scan at eighteen months old. And the doctors had said that they don't know if he will ever walk or talk. So, um, but now at six years of age, maybe I could um, send you the video a v- video of him running around with a Superman cape or oh, with a Captain America cape yeah. on to, you know, because he is just an extraordinary young boy. But you look at the circumstances that what he came from and the reason why he came to us. Um, so there's lots of... They all have their own unique story, and it's not just a case of that, you know, their parents died. That is why we're not called an orphanage, because a true sense of an orphan is um, parentless children. Most of our children actually have living, at least um, a living mother. Um, in a lot, of, a lot of occasions, there's no father's name on the birth certificate. Um, but for um, the most part, a lot of our children's mothers are still alive. But for whatever reason, they have made the decision that they cannot or um, they cannot or do not want to care, raise, raise a child. The other thing is most of our children have also got older siblings as well. So but generally with a different, a different father could be being raised by the grandparents and then the grandparents are saying hey stop I'm not going to keep raising children keep raising your children for you yeah. um so yeah just lots of different lots of different reasons the other thing with the word orphanage is it, it does have a stigma attached yeah. to it so and also we are very we are very focused on making our home a home and a family. A lot of people always ask us, how long can the children stay for? It's like, well, until they choose to leave, because this is their family, this is their home. So if they turn 20, and they've got a full time job outside, but they're not ready to live outside, well, they can still live at home as well. And then go to to work just like we do in our families, you know, and and yeah. um, you know, in a normal family. So we're we're very big on that family focus. When, it's really special, isn't it? Because yeah. it's essentially you're helping those young ones to actually rewrite the story of their lives. Yes, change the narrative, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. When Charlene and I were looking on the website of Mercy International. We saw a whole section about vocational education. So obviously it's not just you're setting them up for a career path as well. Yes. How is that funded? Is that funded through, are they free places in Thailand? Are they funded through donations? Like how do you fund all their education from high, from primary to high school to vocational? So it's a combination of, of things, but primarily it's through donor support. Uh, the founders of Mercy International, Rob and Jean Dunk, they they have built a very loyal support base over the number of years that um, that Mercy International has has existed. Of course, you know we are we we're, we're always building on that as well. But um, what we find is that a lot of people that come in as supporters really recognise 
the quality of care that is given to these children and the investment that goes into it and actually partner with us for a long period of time. And that includes through vocational tertiary education opportunities as well. Just like any of us, not everybody has the, 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 the capability to study at university for three or four years after they finish high school. Some are, some are best suited to go into vocational training or get a job. Yeah. So each situation is is about the individual child, seeing them as an individual and then working through with them about what their desires are as well and, and what is going to be best suited for them. There are vocational colleges um, that are um, government funded, which um, obviously means that the, the expense for us is less. But at the end of the day, you know, they still need Fun, they still need funds to get to and from college every day or, you know, to buy, buy meals or put, put fuel in their motorbikes or whatever. So even where things are free, they're not, they're, there is always an expense with that as well. And we've also got, we've also got um, schools at two of our children's homes um, where they're actually part of the, or joined to the home is also another another way. And so that's all the way from kindergarten through to high school. Where I live, um, our children go out to a school externally. We've been incredibly blessed with a very, very good school where it's actually a, a, um, it's, it's a Christian foundation that has started the school and they're very much about um, empowering world changers. So they want our children to be world changers and the other students at the school to be world changers as well. And they do that through both, both through the building the characters of the children and also through English is a very, very big focus. From, from that perspective, though, we have large school fees that are associated with that, um, or the, albeit they're subsidised by the foundation that, that runs the school, but we do have um, significant school fees. But from my perspective, it's worth it. And I am a big advocate for making sure that we can continue to have our children go through that education system. One of the reasons is because I really believe that when our children get to an age where they've got to start making decisions for themselves, they're also going to probably by then already have recognised that they haven't been raised like a lot most other kids. They've been raised in a children's home and there's going to be a lot of psychological and an emotional trauma that's going to go with that. Yeah. I think that if our children can speak English, if they've got self-confidence, if they're secure in who they are, if they're secure in who they are in God, they're just going to be able to navigate through that time through that season in their life better than if they don't have any of that and the easiest thing to do is jump on a motorbike like a lot of the teenage population of Thailand go and get themselves mixed up in wrong situations and essentially not take their lives down the path that we want them to be going down as far as from a parenting perspective it really sounds like you're building resilient kids. Yeah, which is sounds important. Yeah, 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 which is which is a really key thing for me. It is that is a word. I remember asking a few years ago. I asked some friends, "How do we prepare our children for the future?" Like my parents didn't know to prepare me for what I went through as a teenager. I didn't know I'd have to prepare teenagers for social media and everything like that. So what do I prepare these kids for? And, you know, and resilience was the word that was, was, was came, came back to me and really stayed with me and making them, um, yeah, and instilling that resilience so that they can learn to make wise decisions for themselves. Um, even things like swimming lessons, if you just think about how much confidence something like that gives yeah, it's a child. You know, they've got one more skill, one more feather to their bow. Or, you know, like it just gives them a little bit more confidence, a little bit more secure in who they are. And you know, by speaking English and being able to get a good job and being encouraged and 
like I really think that those kinds of things are going to make a difference in their future. What would you say is the most rewarding part of rewriting your story? For me, I think it's having found my purpose and my my reason for life and my reason for living. Yeah. Wow, that's that's powerful. That's really powerful, yeah. isn't it? And it's definitely a great question as well. So it's it's so good to hear you sharing all these wonderful stories of the young ones that have like come through and all the like almost miracle situations, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. There's lots of miracles. Yeah. If, if someone was to, what would your number one advice be to someone who's like, I don't know my purpose. Like, what? Where would you direct someone that says I've got no purpose? <laughs> it's a tricky question <laughs> and it's tricky because for me it was so clear but it doesn't mean it'll be clear for others yeah um having said that it was clear it was still a journey and like I shared with you you know there was a journey of pain and suffering it was a journey of cleansing look I think the biggest thing is is you have to want it yeah. and you have to you have to want to know you have to want to have purpose and you have to be prepared for where that takes you yeah. you just said something and I, and I want to ask you this question it was a, a journey of pain and suffering would you say that that pain and suffering made the purpose clearer at the end it did yeah. and the reason for that was because God forced me to stop he put me in a bed for seven weeks <laughs> And for and and obviously from God's perspective, he knew that was the only way that I was ever going to hear yeah. him because, like I was saying, you know, I was a very independent person, a very busy person, a very social person. I had a really, really good life, really good, comfortable life, and I didn't really want for much. Yeah. But if I and if I had just kept going on that, I would have just kept myself busy and I would never have because I look back on that season as well and I think, you know, when I had the actual fall, I had no pain. It happened at work, so I had absolutely no financial um no financial issues. It was all covered by work. I was com I was so supported throughout the whole time. It was almost like God was like, right, <laughs> this is what's gotta happen. But I'm not going to completely let you suffer. You know, I'm going to wrap a little bit of support around you and love around you. But and and I I really truly look back look back and I see that you know God had to push me into that corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, it's like and, and I think being pushed into that corner. Look at the lives you've impacted now. You know, it's not about you. Charlene said it. It's not about you changing your story. It's the stories of others that you're changing now, yeah. which is so incredible. And I think if it's one thing about when we change our stories, it's about the impact it's going to have on others and the encouragement. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not only the children that you're, you're impacting, but it's your networks as well. And I, I know, well, this is the first time we've met. However, I have been stalking you a bit. <laughs> and I know you, you're you really good at networking, I've heard, and building networks. Do you feel that they've also shaped your ability to be, the connections you've made, the ability for you to be in Thailand? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's something as simple as when I lived here the first time, social media hardly existed it was email was it like there was you know but this time even things like having a, a group chat with my closest girlfriends and I talk to them nearly every day mm -hmm. just having that networking that support through that network is life-changing for me because you know I'm here by myself I've been I've made some really wonderful friends especially during COVID and once again a time when I couldn't travel back to see friends and family I, I just saw these people come into my life that I didn't even know were here but once again I, I could see that was God looking after me as well with that with that network of of people as well so absolutely it it makes a huge difference for me to have those networks you know and it's 
from an encouragement perspective, from a financial perspective, from a just doing life perspective, it's really made um, it's it's made it so much easier and so much more enjoyable. Because, like I said earlier, this is hard. This is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I live with forty people who none of them speak English. You know, none of them understand. Well, they've they've had to learn to understand my expectations, and you know, doing things in a with a with a Western influence. Well, it's because also influence, isn't it? Like that, man, you're in upper management, so it's it's bringing that into the home as well. As, as well, yeah, yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, we we don't have the ability to be able to pay wages to highly educated people. And at the end of the day, too, we don't actually want that. What we want is people that have got the right heart. Yeah. They've got a mother's heart to be looking after these children. You know, to have people say, "Oh, so have you got a have you got a child psychologist?" Or you know, have we got people that are quite highly uh, qualified with working with children? No, we don't. But we also don't want someone that just sees this as a nine to five job and comes in and then goes home again. Like we're a family. We're a family network. We're a family unit. And if our children are sick or unwell or need to see a specialist, we take them to the doctor, just like just like any family does. We've got to have the right people with the right hearts to be surrounding these children because, once again, you know, the, the, the situations they've come from, they need nurturing and compassion. And um, Yeah. You, you certainly um, put a lot of questions in my mind, you know. <laughs> And challenged me in a lot of ways. So thank you. What about you? Absolutely. You, you know, um, and I'm just wondering, like, what do you, if you were to ask yourself back when you were in New Zealand or tell yourself that you were going to be a mama to so many people in Thailand, what would you have said? Um, <laughs> I would never have ever, I would never have believed it. At the very most, I could have been a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> But that was about it. I mean, I've always loved kids. I've always, I've, and, or, you know, I, I, when I was young, I always wanted to be a school teacher. But I would never have dreamed that I would be doing it in this in this capacity with the intention of doing it forever, as well. It's it's hard. It's it's hard to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Angela, you definitely inspired me. And yeah. me, I'm sure you've inspired Charlene. It's- and I know, obviously, Charlene has a Thai background, like yeah, yeah in her. So she was really um, looking forward to yeah, this. It's been exciting to just to get to meet you and to see who's this person coming on board. It's just yeah, the heart that you have for these young ones. Yeah. And just a few questions to close it off. Um, how can someone support Mercy International, support your home, support you, or get involved, or get involved? Yeah, well, one of the the best ways to support is to um, partner with us on a regular basis as a a child sponsor. So we have um, a child sponsorship program, which is $40 a month. We have multiple sponsors per children because $40 a month is not enough to to raise a child. So we have multiple sponsors per per children. But by being a child sponsor, you get to... um, you get to build a relationship with them to the the, the level that you, that you choose to um, and engage with them. We have many sponsors now that actually come over and meet the children as well. And it's special both ways because it, it, it increases the the world for our or the, the the world awareness for our children as well and it's life-changing I mean I shared my my how about how I came over to visit I had no idea that I was going my life was going to be changed so so dramatically by by partnering as a child sponsorship is a is a great way and that can be done through our 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 website which I'm I I know you're going to share the details and then also um we have projects from time to time as well where we need um support as well and then beyond that one of our greatest ways is by remembering us for our prayer partners and and people that 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 pray to remember us in 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 your prayers because at the end of the day that is what what conquers all and makes a huge difference 
And then also we have um, the opportunity for teams and volunteers and visitors to come over as well to um, for, for any period of time to come and visit, see the, um, the work. Um, you know, I've only just shared about our home in Congen, but we've got two other amazing homes where over 100 children are being raised in those homes as well as our, um, our education schools there as well, where we've got over 1,100 children from the community coming into our schools there as well. So there are, there are several different ways awesome. to partner with us. Awesome, and we'll definitely spread that word. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Angela, our second last question for the night is, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to rewrite their own life story? So I think the biggest piece of advice would be to just be honest with yourself. So meet yourself exactly where you're at. Don't be too proud to see where you're at. Don't be ashamed. Don't be fearful. Don't deny it but just accept that's where you're at. And essentially that's your launch pad. I think from there will come the, the freedom to then be able to recognize this is where I'm at. And hopefully you have a dream or a desire to know where you actually would like to go or at least the direction that you would like to go in. I think, yeah, just that, that honesty to yourself and being able to to recognize that and just also appreciate that the desires that you have in your heart they they are known they are known by God and they may still come to you but just not in the package that you expect them to come to you because at the end of the day God knows what's best for us if, if we do if we do it in our own strength or in our own decision making without partnering with God, well then it might not be the very best that, that we have for our lives. And I think that is you know that, that that has often been at the forefront of my mind in more recent years, you know in my my earlier years as a, my earlier years as a Christian or definitely my my earlier years before I was a Christian, you know, there was, it was always just about, well, what I want to do and what I, but, but without actually realizing that um, you, you can sometimes, you can often get what you want. It just comes to you differently. I think, yeah, just that, just be honest with yourself. And accountability is a big thing too. So if there's someone that you can actually trust and make yourself accountable to a number of years ago, um, I, I talked about being able to build my dream home and that actually came from having a life coach for a, a season when I just really felt like my feet weren't on the ground and I I knew there were th- I knew there were things that I wanted to achieve and I knew there was progress I wanted to make but I just felt I needed to be accountable to someone so that I didn't feel all scattered. And through that process, I was actually able to make some very clear goals, personal goals. Um, and one of those was to have a home, at, like to own my own home, you know. And then I, I got there and I got there in quite a short period of time. And, and the other was, um, one of the others was about my, my employment and being able to, yeah, develop and progress so that was that was a big help for me too and and once again it was a case of not being too proud to be able to go and ask for someone to help me with this and not being scared of what was going to come out of it as well you know not saying that it wasn't scary and I'm not saying that you know I I wasn't too proud at, at times but looking back on it it's one of those things that you can say, well, you know, well, if I had done things differently, you know, would I have had a more, be more, be more open-minded about something or, you know, just kind of said, okay, well, it's not that scary. Just give it a go. Yeah, yeah. That's so. so important. I know like we do a lot of coaching with clients, but we also have a coach and it's about that. It's about that accountability. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. It's a deadly words of wisdom. Yeah. Final question. If you could rewrite your life again, would you do it the same way? Short answer is yes, because I have that contentment about knowing that I am in the purpose 
I'm living the purpose for my life. It would be nice to do it without <laughs> the pain and the suffering. But of course, you know, you don't know that that's part of it when you're going through it. Absolutely. So, but essentially, I guess you're saying, do I have regrets? And the answer is no. One. Yeah, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm where I'm, I know that. I'm called to be. Angela, thank you so much for your Absolutely. time. I know that you're coming out to Sydney later in the year. Yes. So I am looking forward to meeting you in person. Yes, I'd right. love to. Um, but thank you. And, uh, and to all our listeners, I'm sure they're thanking you for your inspiring story as well. Thank you, Angela. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. You're welcome. Now that we've explored our main topic for today and interviewed our guests, Let's take a moment to recap the key insights and highlights from today's episode. Man, what an awesome podcast, right? Yeah. Such a story. It, it's, a, it's such a story of change. Like, you know, throughout that whole podcast, I'm like, I don't think I could do something so outrageous. I don't think I could do something so, well, is it dramatic? Well, for Angela, it wasn't dramatic, but for, for anyone just to relocate their whole lives mm -hmm. um and i think what she's doing is such a beautiful thing and if if this yeah. podcast can do anything but you know spread awareness of what mercy international does yeah. you know like just sp spread awareness that there are children that need people's helps yeah Absolutely. And it's such an amazing, it takes a special person to do something like that, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I think the one thing I learned from Angela is do it sooner. Yeah. You know, she wouldn't have waited so long um, yeah. to. That's the only thing she would have changed. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Just to do it sooner and have learned those lessons. But, you know, during, around the time that we've known Angela, we've, we've sponsored two little kids. Yeah from Mercy International mm -hmm. and, and from her ho house in particular. Two gorgeous kids. Two gorgeous <laughs> kids um, because Mercy has three three houses throughout yeah. Thailand. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, just amazing the story of, of these three little kids and watching them grow um, so much. Like both of them were just left in the hospital days, like just soon after they were born. They're mm -hmm. only, That's like okay. the oldest is only three months now. Yeah. And then the youngest is only uh, not even a month. Right. Oh, no, no, sorry. He is three months, but he was born yeah. two and a half months premature. Okay. And just seeing the love that they share for each other, like all the kids, like okay. when you see the photos and all the older little kids. When I say older kids, I'm talking about two, three-year-old <laughs> playing with the babies. It's yeah. just... Um, just showering love on them and yeah, it's, it's like really getting clucky. <laughs> yeah, it's so, so beautiful. So... Yeah, if you want to know more about Mercy International and their work, we That's really great. encourage you to reach out to them. You can find their website also, and there's more details in the show notes about what Mercy does and their houses. And I know they also have um, experiences where if people want to go out and have a, a trip there and mm -hmm. help with the um, orphanages, well, they're not orphanages, the home, sorry, yeah. and help with construction or building. They always welcome teams as well. Yeah. So you know, that could be a part of rewriting your life story. I know right. we're thinking about it mm -hmm. um, going out and the only thing is I don't know, it's so hot. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's a part of the point. Yeah. That's not yeah. part of the point. So, yeah, yeah, reach out to Mercy if you want to find out more and support their work and support their um, looking after these vulnerable that's children right. that have and that have nowhere to go. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you found it informative and inspiring. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and share it with your friends and family. Also, make sure to visit our website at www.rewriteyourlifestory.com.au to learn more about our mission, products and services. And remember, you have the power to rewrite your own life story. So go out there, face your challenges head on and create the life you've always wanted. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.